Welcome to episode 43 of Liberty Dad Podcast, where we prepare for tomorrow's political conversation by how we engage today. If you are new to the show, Liberty represents the message of all your freedom all the time. And Dad represents the delivery, recognizing that tomorrow's conversation with my son is determined by how I engage with him today, and then applying that to those around me. I'm your host, D.L., and this episode is Three Pillars of Libertarianism, the Non-Aggression Principle, where I'll discuss the Non-Aggression Principle, or as known and stated briefly by many, the NAP. In the last episode, I discussed self-ownership as being the unequivocal right of ownership of your own body. This means that what you choose to put into it, how you choose to use it, and what right, and, and why that right of ownership extends to things that you produce and own. Let's continue in this series and dive right on in. In this series, I discussed the three pillars I believe that are fundamental ideas of libertarianism. Those pillars are self-ownership, the non-aggression principle, and freedom of association. These aren't presented to be bulletproof philosophical arguments. If you're watching and are a non-libertarian, you might have wondered what's going through the mind of a libertarian when they take a stand on any given issue. And if you're a libertarian, you might have wondered what's going through the mind of a non-libertarian who just cannot see what feels like the obvious answer to whatever conversation you two are having. Instead of a great philosophical musing, this series is meant to help non-libertarians understand a bit why libertarians believe the way they do, and take such stalwart and uncompromising positions. It's also meant to provide a different approach for libertarians when talking to their non-libertarian friends, family, and whomever else. The first question that someone might have is, why boil it down to only three concepts? and these three specifically. The first reason is any time that you can break something down into threes, it's easier to communicate. Second reason is that these are the most common concepts that I believe impact the day-to-day -day conversations on most issues that people talk about and are the most relevant to laws that are passed. Lastly, I think that once people have a simple foundation to work with, conversations that get more complex are a bit easier to understand and discuss. And most conversations that libertarians and non-libertarians have do end up going from simple to complex pretty quickly. For instance, if I were to offer opposition to licensing laws and discuss the absurdity of barbers and hairstylists who must first go through training and various all manner of legal hoops before opening up shop it's inevitable that someone is going to leap to ask, so would you want someone who's unlicensed, like an unlicensed brain surgeon, to operate on you? And that's the kind of thing that we want to try to address with more simple concepts because the more complex concepts become a little bit easier to digest. With that, we'll start with what I believe is the concept that naturally follows the right of self-ownership, which I discussed in the last episode, and that would be the non-aggression principle, or as succinctly stated, the NAP. When I discussed self-ownership, I did not provide a definition because I believe the term is rather self-defining. But in this case, it's worth taking a moment to define the non-aggression principle so that we are operating on the same understanding. Here is a formal definition. The principle of non-aggression is a concept that asserts aggression is inherently illegitimate. Aggression is defined as the initiation of physical force against persons or property, the threat of such or fraud upon persons or their property. The non-aggression principle does not preclude the use of self-defense up to and including lethal force. The most obvious example being that it is a violation to break into my home in the middle of the night. And if you do, I have the right to respond with violence, including potentially killing you. That would be an example of using physical force on my property, that is breaking in, and the threat of physical force against me, being in my home, uninvited, in the middle of the night. It's generally an easy conversation when we talk about violence 
perpetrated against you and the threat of force against you. Although the threat of force against you can at times be ambiguous, at least when considering how one should respond. The most challenging elements of this are in the areas of fraud and with property, in my opinion. And again, it tends to be a matter more about response than it is about a violation of you. I want you to consider this hypothetical. Imagine that I am a single man and I decide to, decide to head out to the bar on a Friday evening. While I'm there, I meet a woman and in the course of each of us telling the other about ourselves, I tell her that I'm a millionaire. This impresses her greatly and leads to a decision to head home with me for the evening. And after a night of passion, we wake up the next morning and then I confess, ah, I'm really broke and I got fired three days ago. I have just committed fraud against the woman because I told her something that influenced her decision to stay the night with me. This isn't much different than me selling a car and telling someone that it's never been in an accident when in fact it has and has incurred damage to the frame. In both cases, the lying person wants something from the other person and used deceit to get it. The question here is, what should the person who is tricked do? Their life is not immediately in danger of force, so to say, uh, they are, and so they are not justified in, say, punching the other person. Though many might be willing to accept that the woman slapping me in the morning after confessing my lie might be appropriate. In the car example, the person I have sold a car to is at least due the money that they gave me since that information would most likely have altered their decision to either purchase the car or at least the amount for which they purchased it. In both scenarios, and anyone you can really conceive of, the foundation for a claim against the other person has the same origin, the right of self-ownership. As I discussed in my last episode, since I own myself and anything that comes from the use of myself, such as a car or my home, I alone have the authority to determine what may be done to it or with it. Maybe I authorize someone to break into my home because I want to test the security. Companies do this all the time. Maybe a woman who uh, wants to sleep with men who are wealthy. Maybe she doesn't care. Maybe a man wants to buy a car with damage to the frame. Maybe he does not. On and on. There are two more concepts that I think are necessary to discuss when it comes to the non-aggression principle. That is proportionality and assignment. It's probably quite obvious that the reaction to any of these three examples would be vastly different if someone breaks into my home. Most people would not argue with my right to shoot the intruder. Whether a particular circumstance is wa uh, warrants that response is another matter. But let's take a moment and we'll talk about this assignment that I mentioned just a moment ago before we get into the, the issue of proportionality. When we're discussing assignment, anything that you can do with your body or your property, you can assign to somebody else. For instance, if I decide that I want to get into a boxing match, well, I can decide that I don't want to be punched, or I can decide that I do want to be punched for money, hopefully, and maybe some glory if I were to happen to win. So consider that this self-ownership allows me to decide what I can do with this body and then decide what other people can do with this body and by extension, any property. Now that we have that underway, let's, talk, uh, let's go back to this proportionality. And I was last suggesting that whether a particular circumstance was warranted is you know, some sort of different matter because not all circumstances warrant the same response. For instance, if I hear a noise in the kitchen, maybe I go downstairs with my gun in hand and I see a child has broken into my home and is eating leftovers out of my refrigerator. Many people would normally agree that I have the right to shoot an intruder, but they might change their mind in this particular scenario. That doesn't mean that I don't have the right to eject this child from my home, but the question becomes, is the threat of force against me so great 
that it requires a lethal response. Again, proportionality. The reason people might not object to a woman slapping a man who lied his way into sex or shooting a man who has broken into someone's home and threatened their family or not shooting a child who broke into the home and is eating leftovers or not beating up the man who lied about a car that he sold someone else is because the response to any violation of the non-aggression principle should be proportional to the violation. When that response exceeds some reasonable proportionality, it becomes a matter of violating the non-aggression principle in the opposite direction. That is, the person who may have originally been the victim now becomes the aggressor. Consider this scenario. Imagine a man is taunting a woman, calling her all manner of foul names for whatever reason as she walks down the street. She does her best to ignore him, but he persists. And at some point, he reaches over and smacks her on the butt. She turns around and then sprays him right in the face with pepper spray. So far, so good with proportionality. But then imagine that while the man is rubbing his eyes and probably screaming, the woman starts smacking him, you know, maybe hitting him with her purse. Well, with the pepper spray, most people would agree that it was an appropriate response. Without evidence, I'm betting at this point, many people may still agree that she's within her right, but that she probably could have just sprayed him and then turned around and kept walking. But then imagine further if she picks up a rock and she smacks him on the head. The man is now dazed and he's bleeding. Certainly, some will say, ah, I guess he'll think twice before messing with a woman, won't he? But others, now they might start questioning and moving away from the idea of supporting her actions and acknowledge that she has probably started to exceed any reasonable um, definition of self-defense. Not finished, imagine the man now tries to flee, but the woman is still angry and takes chase. And then she catches up to him quickly and she hits him a few more times on the head until he loses consciousness and falls to the ground. At this point, the shift among most people is likely that the man has started out as the aggressor, but now it is the woman who has become the aggressor. We'll stop there. There's really no need to take that story any further. The point is that proportionality helps to identify when a response is appropriate and when it is not. In the previous thought experiment, we can see where the situation is clearly favorable to the woman's actions, and also where they are not, and where it's kind of arguable. A moment ago, I said fraud and property are the most challenging. And by that, I mean those are the ones that most likely will stir up debate between libertarians and non-libertarians, and maybe sometimes even libertarians. Here's why. Fraud and property often, but not always, lack the direct threat to an individual. There is a difference between a child breaking into my home for leftovers and a man breaking in seeking to harm me. There is also a difference between, say, a woman who is lied to by a man and a man who slaps her on the butt. In all four cases, the individual has been violated, no question. The thief taking leftovers is taking something that I have worked for with my own body. And similar to the garden analogy in the last episode, because I have worked for the food, I may choose what happens to it, whether that is that I eat it, sell it, give it away, or throw it away. And likewise, a man that lies to a woman in the context of trying to get something from her, not merely just lying in itself, he is committing fraud by using deceit to convince her to do something that she might not otherwise choose to do. Since it is her body, she has the right to determine under what conditions she will share it. Lying changes her perspective of whether or not those conditions have been met. The question becomes, how may each person respond and what is the appropriate compensation for said violations? Those questions are probably for another day. In this episode, I simply want to discuss the non-aggression principle as a concept that is fundamental to libertarian thinking and how we see the world. If you're a libertarian, you might say, ah, DL, this is boring and rudimentary. It is, 
but it's often something that I think is overlooked when presenting our views to non-libertarians. A senior software developer made an interesting comment to me years ago regarding other senior developers. He said, over time, many developers forget what it's like to be new. That same applies here. Many libertarians forget what it's like to not know all that they know about libertarianism. We forget to provide a stable foundation for understanding why we see the world in the terms that we do. And when that happens, many people see some of our positions on maybe various news topics that we're talking about as absurd, even cruel. If you're a non-libertarian who's watching, then consider what you've heard in this episode and the previous episode on self-ownership. If you haven't seen the previous one, I really encourage you to do so. Self-ownership lays the foundation for the non-aggression principle. Both of these concepts should help you to start understanding why libertarians take such stalwart and uncompromising positions that they do. One last point. Earlier, during my imagined story between the man and the woman, I kept referring to many or most people and how they might respond. Astute listeners might have wondered if the non-aggression principle is based on what the majority believes. The answer is, no it does not. The reason I made those references was to illustrate that the non-aggression principle is one that society already naturally kind of understands. The libertarian community has simply made it a more formal concept in their worldview and their interaction with others. The same goes for the concept of self-ownership. Much of the world already recognizes it on some level. Libertarians just use, it that, use that as a starting point for all matters. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Be sure to leave me a comment wherever you are watching this from. If you didn't see my video on self-ownership, be sure to check it out. And tune in next week as I discuss the third and final pillar, freedom of association. And then after that, I'll take all three and I'll discuss how they apply to modern debates and items in the news. But for now, let's go ahead and have a bill review. But I know I'll be a law someday, at least I hope and pray that I will. But today I am still just a bill. I am not in any way a lawyer. What follows is not in any way legal advice and is not intended to speak in any authority on legal matters. I am only acting in the capacity of a general citizen with the ability to read and interpret a concatenation of words and render an opinion. The goal of the bill review is to promote the idea that everyday Americans can and should take the time to read any legislation, order, or mandate. Since I'm not a lawyer, this isn't a legal interpretation, and I may be wrong. Bills range from a page or two to many thousands of pages long. And since they can be rather dry, this segment is short and only meant to show you just how much you can learn in only a few minutes. This episode, I am reviewing Alabama Senate Bill 10, known as the Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act, which prohibits gender change therapy for minors and prohibits withholding of certain related information from parents. If you saw this in the news recently, then you know that there was pretty heated debate about whether or not Alabama should legally prevent minors from having surgical changes to conform to their identified gender. And that debate hit the news just shortly after Sen Senator Rand Paul questioned Rachel Levine, the president's cabinet nominee who is transgender herself over the issue of puberty blockers for minors. The debate over transgender issues gets complicated very quickly. But this is a bill review, and all I intend to do is review this bill as fairly as possible. With that, here's what the synopsis of the bill has to say. Quote, this bill would prohibit the performance of medical, a medical procedure or the prescription or issuance of medication upon or to a minor child that is intended to alter the appearance of the minor child's gender or delay puberty with certain exceptions. This bill would provide for the disclosure of certain information concerning students to parents by schools. This bill would also establish criminal penalties for violations. Before we get into what this bill kind of specifically does, let's have a few legal definitions as provided in the bill. The bill declares that a minor 
is defined the same as in Section 438-1 of the Code of Alabama. And that definition is person who is under 19 years of age. Okay, guess what? That seems pretty straightforward. Next, it defines the word sex. It defines it like this, quote, the biological state of being male or female based on the individual's sex organs, chromosomes, and endogenous hormone profiles, end quote. What I want you to do is keep that definition kind of in your mind for just a moment. It becomes relevant as we review what this, what this bill specifically prohibits, which we find under Section 3A. And that says, quote, except as provided in subsection B, no person shall engage in, counsel, make a referral for, or cause any of the following practices to be performed upon a minor if the practice is performed for the purpose of attempting to alter the appearance of or affirm the minor's perception of his or her gender or sex. If that perception is inconsistent with the minor's sex as defined in this act, end quote. Then goes on to list various procedures and pharmaceuticals that are prohibited. Already, we have a problem. Do you see it? This bill limits defining sex to A, sex organs, B, chromosomes, and C, endogenous hormone profiles, measurable hormone levels. But then it prohibits anyone from engaging in counseling, referring, or causing specific practices to be performed if the minor's, uh, if the minor's sex differs from their perception of their sex or gender. In other words, this bill uses perception of sex and gender that differ from the actual sex as defined in the bill, but does not make the effort to define the word gender. Regardless of one's view of gender reassignment surgery, and even for minors, we should all have strong reservations against any bill that seeks to limit citizen behavior without clear definitions. Remember, this law comes with criminal penalties for violations. You might say, come on, DL, there's only two genders, and you know it. Well, do we? The concept of gender is heavily debated right now, and there are many people, experts and lay, who have strong views on the matter. If you've watched the episode where I review Robin D'Angelo's book, White Fragility, this bill does something that I criticized her for doing. In her published 2011 paper, which introduces the concept of white fragility, she has this to say, quote, Whiteness studies begin with the premise that racism and white privilege exist in both traditional and, mod and modern forms, and rather than work to prove its existence, work to reveal it." End quote. I might say this. This bill begins with the premise that there are only two genders, and rather than work to prove this, works to retain them. Any law that Americans accept should only operate on well-defined definitions first, not after the fact all the more when considering laws that come with criminal punishments. Observing various conversations on the matter, I've come across this objection quite a few times, that activists are out there pushing their children or others' children to change their sex at the mere hint of a child's interest. The argument here being that some activists might take, say, a three-year-old boy playing with makeup as a sign that he is transgender, and will push that child in that direction, rather than just simply let him explore the world around him. Now, if that's your argument, then propose a bill that deals with that issue specifically. Now, anyone who may scoff at the idea that such a thing would ever happen, hmm, I've got something for you too. I encourage you to look up the story of David Reimer. David, born Bruce, underwent circumcision in 1965 to resolve an underlying medical issue. That procedure went horribly wrong, disfiguring the boy beyond surgical repair. Concerned about his future, David's parents took him to see John Money, Money of John Hopkins in Baltimore of 1967. Dr. Money was an early proponent for the theory of gender neutrality and recommended that the boy undergo sex reassignment at the age of 22 months and then be raised as a girl. David was reassigned and renamed to Brenda. You can read the very tragic story yourself, but ultimately, David rejected being Brenda, and his experience, along with other life events, resulted in him committing suicide at the age of 38. Maybe activist parents 
or medical professionals are pushing children to accept their interpretation of gender and not the child's. Again, write a bill for that. And we can review it. Medical decisions are best left between patient and doctor, parents or legal guardians when dealing with a minor. Medicine is complex, and we learn new things every day. This bill is fundamentally flawed, and Alabama residents should reject it. That isn't to say there is nothing here that warrants legislative attention. There may be, but it needs to be specific and well-defined. Legislation, co legislation comes with the force of government, and we should never forget that. We should all be mindful of what power we give our government. Should this bill pass and withstand future legal challenges, it furthers the idea that government can and should intervene between you and your doctor regarding matters of your child. If after all of this, you still disagree with me, I want you to consider something. Even though the bill may seem limited to protecting children from adults who experiment on them, it can easily be used as justification to say that parents who do not say vaccinate their children are equally harming them. Because the foundation for this bill is protecting children from what is seen as rogue parents and doctors. Those who support this bill fail to recognize that the only difference between government interfering on the matter of gender and on the matter of, say, vaccines, is whether or not the government has been given the authority to intervene in the first place. That's all for this episode. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit that subscribe button. And to catch Liberty Dad episodes when they air, head over to facebook.com forward slash free speech media network, where the weekly episode of Just Me airs Monday night at 10 p.m. Or join Josh Fields from the Libertarian Apothecary and me on Friday night at 11 p.m. for a discussion-style episode of the same topic. And while you're there, be sure to check out other free speech media shows. Finally, remember this. If you're a champion of liberty, your business is people, and your product is liberty. Have a great week. Catch you next time, and I'm out.